Hi, everyone. Welcome to Summer STEAM for Tweens. I'm Miss Jennifer here at the Warrington Library. Today's program is part of our summer reading program, All Together Now. We are going to learn some ways animals and plants get along and work together to accomplish their goals. If you picked up your supplies here at the library, you have, you'll have everything that you need for this program, except for a paper plate or pie tin. If you didn't get a bag, you'll also need to gather M&Ms, Skittles, a large craft stick, a couple of chenille stems, cheese puffs, a Ziploc bag, and a small jar with a lid. It can be hard to survive in the wild. Most animals are hunted by other animals. To survive against animals that prey on them, some animals have developed specific camouflage tactics to fool their predators. One strategy some animals use is to look very similar to other animals that are poisonous or that the predator doesn't like to eat. This camouflage tactic is called mimicry. Viceroy butterflies are an example of an animal that has evolved mimicry. Their wing color and pattern look, look almost exactly like monarch butterfly wings. Since monarch butterflies are poisonous to many predators, predators avoid eating any animal that look like them. Other animals use mimicry to look larger than they really are. Several moths and butterflies have designs on their wings that look like the eyes of larger animals. For example, the owl butterfly has big round spots on its wings. When the wings are spread, these spots look like owl eyes. Predators are fooled into thinking they're looking at an owl's face instead of a butterfly, so they leave the butterfly alone. Several king snakes look just like Coral snakes. King snakes are harmless, so they are vulnerable to predators. But coral snakes are venomous animals who can defend themselves well. By mimicking coral snakes, king snakes are able to deter predators. Our first activity will demonstrate the effectiveness of mimicry. You should have a bag of candy in your supply bag. If you are preparing your own bag at home, you'll need to mix 10 yellow, 10 blue, 10 green, 10 brown, 10 red, and 10 orange M&Ms with any 10 Skittles of the same color. Like here I have red. Um, just don't use the purple ones. The M&Ms will represent different kinds of animals in the wild, and the Skittles will represent poisonous animals that a predator wouldn't want to eat. You are playing the role of a predator. The M&Ms are their prey while the Skittles are poisonous. We're going to pour the contents of our bag, or if you're making this at home, your Skittles and M&Ms onto your plate so that they are all mixed together, just like this. We are going to set a timer and use our finger like a beak. We're going to use our pointer finger and our thumb to make a beak shape. And we are going to be, uh, skit, uh, excuse me, M&Ms eating birds. The Skittles are poisonous and the M&Ms are food we like to eat. We're going to have 15 seconds to use our beak to quickly pick up M&Ms and quickly put them into your other hand. All right, you should avoid picking up any Skittles. Remember, because the Skittles are poisonous and will make you sick. Ready? Let me get my timer and go we're just using our two fingers and we're going to pick up those m m's remember we don't want skittles no nope, that one looked like a skittle to me oh and there goes my timer so we can take a look at how many skittles we have and it looks like I have avoid picking up, avoided picking up any Skittles. I hope you did too. Now I did have one red M&M sneak in, but I certainly have more colors of the other, of, of, uh, more M&Ms of the other colors than I do of the red. And that's because it's very hard to tell the difference between a red Skittle and a red 
M and M. Don't they look about the same? Now we uh, counted, or you should be counting the number of each type of candy you picked up and see which color M&M was the least picked one. What do you think this has to do with camouflage? At a glance, it is difficult to tell M&Ms and Skittle candies apart. Skittles are less flat than M&Ms, but their colors are very similar. This is why if you tell someone to avoid picking a certain color of Skittles, then if they are picking the candies quickly, they are less likely to pick M&Ms that are the same color as those Skittles. The M&Ms are being camouflaged by having the same color and similar shape as the Skittles. Consequently, if you had red, then you should have, if you had red Skittles, you should have fewer red M&Ms than of any other color. All right, let's talk about another way that animals work together and get along. Symbiosis is when two different organisms live together and interact. These interactions typically fall into one of three categories. Mutualism is when two or more organisms are in a symbiotic relationship in which both organisms benefit. Commensalism is when two or more organisms are in a symbiotic relationship in which one organism benefits while the other is neither harmed nor helped. Parasitism is when two or more organisms are in a symbiotic relationship where one organism benefits, the parasite, and one is harmed, the host. Examples of this would be fleas, ticks, leeches, lice, or tapeworms that can live in or on humans or animals. Today we're going to discuss examples of mutualism and commensalism rather than parasitism. After all, we're learning about animals working together. The symbiotic relationship between an anemone and a clownfish is an example of two organisms benefiting each other. Clownfish get protection from the anemone's stinging tentacles. The clownfish eats invertebrates that the anemone attracts. This is mutualism. The relationship between barnacles and whales is commensalism. It is something that doesn't affect the whales in any way. However, it helps the barnacles and plays an important role in their survival. Barnacles attach themselves to the whale, which gives them sufficient protection against other predators in the water. Predators won't approach the whales as they are toward the top of the oceanic food chain. Egyptian plovers and crocodiles are another example of, of a mutualistic relationship. Can you see the little bird on top of the head there? That is the plover. When plovers see a crocodile lying outside the water with its mouth open, they will enter the mouth of the crocodile, pluck out the food stuck on its teeth, and fly out again. The crocodiles allow this because the plovers are helping the crocodile by cleaning their mouth. This will reduce the chances of the crocodiles developing infections of the mouth. Sharks and the remora fish have a mutualistic relationship where the remora fish eats parasites on the shark's skin, thereby cleaning the shark. It will also pick up leftover food from the shark's mouth. In addition to free and easy to get food, the remora also enjoys a free ride along the way. Sharks, on the other hand, enjoy this relationship as it helps them get cleaned and keep irritating parasites away. Finally, the symbiotic relationship between oxpeckers and the black rhinoceros is also mutually beneficial. Can you see the little bird on the top of the rhino's head? Um, the oxpecker will remove and eat ticks and other parasitic bugs from the rhino. They can often also alert the animals to threats of attack by predators flying up and making lots of noise. Our next activity will demonstrate how the symbiotic relationship between bees and flowers is mutualistic. Bees and flowers help each other accomplish their goals. Bees gather nectar for honey from flowers and flowers are pollinated by the bees. Let's do our next activity. We're going to start with our chenille stems and our craft stick and we're going to twist the stems around the top of the craft stick so that they connect 
and make little legs for a B. We're going to do that two more times so that our B will have six legs. Twist that around. And one more time. They can all be right about the same length, but if some of them are a little bit off, that's okay. We're going to bend the, the ends down just a little bit so that they'll have some little feet right there at the bottom. This is what mine looks like when it's done. I have decorated the top here with a little plastic B, which you got in your bag if you picked one up, but you could also decorate it with just construction paper or draw one with a magic marker, um, however you would like to do that. So we are taking our B and we're going to pollinate a flower. So I've taken the lid of our jar and put in a flower sticker and you can also decorate yours with construction paper or a sticker or whatever you'd like to do. Just draw a flower onto the lid if you would like. Um, the container and lid will represent the pistil or center of a flower. So we're going to take our cheese puffs and I have opened a bag already and put a couple of them into your Ziploc bag. You can reuse the bag that you had your Skittles or your M&Ms in if you would like, and you have that at home. Um, but you probably just need about three cheese puffs. And now comes the fun part. You can smush these up because we are going to make pollen out of your cheese puffs. And as we all know, this orange powder gets everywhere. <laughs> then pollen does too when you go out especially this time of year, you probably see that yellow dust all over your parents' cars and all sorts of things. So cheese puff dust and pollen have a lot in common. So we're gonna smash that all up and that is going to go into your jar. Let me show you what I'm doing down here. So we're putting our cheese puff dust into the jar. And we're going to use our B to transport it from one part of the jar to the next. All right. And you can do this with as many Cheeto puffs as you would like. Um, and you can, of course, always eat the remainder if mom and dad say it's okay. <laughs> All right. So we are going to um, take our little bee friend here, dip the bee's legs into the round container full of pollen, quote unquote pollen. And once they have a good amount of pollen on the legs, we're gonna fly them over to the empty jar and yours can be farther apart if you want. You can do this from one table to another or from one side of the kitchen counter to another, but I'll just do this short distance here for demonstrating. And we're going to fly them over and drop off some of the pollen. We're going to continue to do this until you feel that you and your bee have properly pollinated the other flower. So we can see some of the little pollen pieces have landed on the other flower. And that is exactly how bees do it. They move it from one flower to the other when they are gathering the nectar. I hope that you have enjoyed today's program. Come by the library to check out these books featuring more information about animals and symbiosis. We also have more summer steam coming your way every other week all summer long. Don't forget to register for a supply bag to pick up everything you'll need to participate at home. In the meantime, head over to our website, FalkierLibrary.org, Click on the research button and select science, math, and environment from the list shown. There you'll find Science Online, a resource featuring articles, videos, experiments, and activities to enjoy on a range of scientific topics. Thanks for watching.